Hello everyone and welcome to our last lecture of the semester dealing with diseases and disease causing microbes of the semester. In this lecture we will talk about the diseases caused by helminths. Again as always we're not going over every single possible disease caused by a helminth but we're just hitting the highlights and going over some of the most significant ones. Now just as a quick refresher because it has been a while since we talked about this Remember that the helminths are the infectious worms and flukes. There are lots of different types of worms in the world. Not all of them are infectious. In fact, I would probably say most of them are not, but some of them are, and those that are infectious are considered helminths. And within the helminths, there are two main types. There are the roundworms and there are the flatworms. Roundworms are also called nematodes. And these types of worms infect primarily the intestines, but they can also infect other types of tissues as well. So I kind of divide these into intestinal parasites and tissue parasites. And then in terms of the flatworms, there are two types of those. There are the cestodes, which are the tapeworms, which are typically only intestinal. There are some exceptions to that. You're looking at a tapeworm here on this picture. But for the most part, the tapeworms are intestinal parasites. And there are also the trematodes. These are called flukes. And we'll talk about flukes at the end of this lecture. But basically, these are flat, usually kind of oval-shaped organisms that primarily infect tissues like blood, lung, and liver. The first organism that we'll talk about in this lecture is a roundworm that infects primarily the intestines. It is called Ascariasis lumbricoides, and the disease it causes is called Ascariasis. In terms of how people end up developing this condition or this disease, basically the eggs are ingested. This is typically a fecal oral transmission type situation. They germinate, the larvae travel through the body, the person ends up um, either kind of coughing them up or getting them into their mouth somehow. They swallow them again. The larvae then mature in the small intestine and the adult worms live in the small intestine. This worm happens to produce quite a few eggs per day, up to 200,000. Those eggs can survive for up to two months in the soil. So it's relatively easy for someone to come in contact with this worm because the eggs can survive so well outside the human body. Again, as we're talking about all of these situations, most of the time we don't see a lot of this in the US or other developed countries. It's possible, of course, absolutely. We just don't tend to see a lot of it due to the type of sewage systems we have, due to the type of agriculture we have, and usually kind of the separation of fecal matter and hopefully our hands and the, the soil that we grow our food in or the soil that we play in, that you know kids play in, um, stuff like that. But it is still possible for something like this to happen. Our next form is another roundworm that is also an intestinal parasite for the most part. This one, out of all of the ones we're talking about, is probably the most common type of worm infection in the United States. Its scientific name is Enterobius vermicularis, but most people just call it the pinworm. So with pinworms, the way they are transmitted is the eggs are spread, again, through the fecal oral route, somehow or another in most cases. The eggs are swallowed, they hatch in the small intestine, the females will then exit the body, expel their eggs, oftentimes with such force, that they become airborne. So they kind of kind of contaminate everything around that person as well, whether we're talking about sheets, other types of bed linens, etc. Um, the eggs can also hatch on the skin. So most of the time the eggs are deposited outside the body and then someone else will pick them up on their hands, they will get them in their mouth, and then they will get a case of pinworms. But occasionally, especially when someone is sharing a bed with someone else, the eggs can get onto their skin, hatch on the skin, 
and then kind of crawl through the rectum up into the large intestine that way. The adults primarily live in the large intestine and rectum. They feed mostly on E. coli. They can, in females, cause vaginal infections, but they usually don't last super long there. It is possible, but most of the time they don't last very long there because there aren't as many food sources there for them. There are bacteria that inhabit the vagina, but not always the right ones for them to feed off of and survive very well. Our next one is Nicator americanus. It is most commonly called the hookworm. And this guy is kind of fun because instead of the traditional fecal oral route, this one actually burrows through the skin on your body. Most of the time it is through your feet, but not always. It could technically burrow anywhere in your skin. But most of the time it's through your feet and oftentimes it's easier for the worm to infect you if you already have like a small cut or something because it just makes it that much easier to get into your skin. Once it gets into your body, it travels through your capillaries and then through your venules and other types of blood vessels up to your lungs eventually where you will cough it up and then swallow it again. It will then mature in the small intestine where it typically will live for three to five years. So each individual worm will usually live for three to five years. However, there seem to be some that can live like 15 years maximum. From there, it's just kind of going to hang out in your small intestine, use your body as nutrients, use the nutrients that you take in through food to grow. It will produce about 100,000 eggs per day that will be deposited into the soil or some kind of sewage system. And then the cycle can start again with someone else potentially. Our next one is also a roundworm, but we're moving into kind of the tissue parasite situation here. This one is called Wurchuria bancrofti. It's kind of a, a mouthful to say, and most people just refer to it as elephantitis. That's not entirely accurate to, to say that. Elephantitis is the condition that it causes, not necessarily the name of the worm, but if you say, just call it elephantitis, then everyone will know how that came to be, basically, and what the worm is. This worm is spread by mosquitoes. It infects lymph vessels for the most part, so this mosquito will bite someone, will transmit this parasite to a person, that parasite, this worm, will kind of crawl through the body into the lymph system where it will cause massive inflammation and fluid accumulation. Something that's very interesting, at least in my opinion about this, is that there's been a lot of research done recently that indicates that it's not the worm alone that causes the massive inflammation. It is a bacteria that lives on the worm. So it's a symbiont um, a symbiotic relationship, this bacterial symbiont that lives on the worm. And the genus of that is called Wolbachia. It's a gram-negative organism, lives on this worm, and our body responds very, very strongly to that organism. So what ends up happening is wherever this worm has kind of lodged itself in the body, our body responds, especially to one, to the worm, but primarily it seems to be to this bacterial species that lives on the worm, sends a massive amounts of fluid there and kind of tries to fight this infection, usually not very effectively, and ends up causing massive swelling in one particular area. It's very common to see this in the legs, it could be on the arms, in males, it could be in the testicles, and basically just one area of the body that's particularly been infected gets this massive amount of fluid accumulation that causes skin stretching and tissue, to a certain extent, tissue destruction and just kind of general interruption of normal functioning. You can treat this with antihelminthics as well as antibiotics to help get rid of that Wolbachia species. And it can be very effective in reducing a lot of the inflammation and helping get rid of some of that fluid. Although most of the time, 
when someone's had a really extensive or really bad infection, it's never really going to go back to the way it was before. You can help drain the fluid, you can reduce the fluid through various different means, you can treat the infection, but once the tissue and the skin has been stretched to that extent, sometimes it doesn't really go back to quite the way it was before. If you go to Google Images and type in elephantitis, you'll see some really, really serious um, scenarios or cases, and you'll understand why the tissue might never really go back to the way it was before. Another roundworm that is a tissue parasite is one called Dracunculus mediensis. This is another kind of mouthful, and so most people just call it the guinea worm. The guinea worm is another kind of interesting one since we're not talking about the typical fecal oral transmission the way we do with so many helminthic infections. The way this one works is the larvae of the worms are swallowed from drinking water sources. The worms or the larvae will burrow through the small intestines. They will migrate to just below the skin. It can be anywhere on the body, but it's kind of most common in the legs and in the arms, kind of in the extremities. Then what they do is start to release different types of enzymes that will kind of degrade the skin. In addition, our body will start to release inflammatory chemicals. And what ends up happening is the skin will start to form an open sore. The open sore indicates that the worm is there, which is one, problematic in and of itself, but two, it may be a source of a secondary infection for that person. So they may end up developing a bacterial infection or a fungal infection that kind of compounds the situation that's already going on. Now, this worm can be removed from the body, but it has to be done very slowly and very carefully. The reason for that is if this worm breaks open, it may release a variety of proteins that many people are allergic to. They may develop anaphylactic shock and die as a result. So if there are anti-helminthic infection, or I'm sorry, anti-helminthic medications available, that is wonderful for helping treat the infection. It still needs to be, the worm itself needs to be dealt with carefully because even if the worm dies, it still could potentially re some, uh, release some toxic chemicals or some, some chemicals that could cause people to have allergic reactions. If there are not anti-helminthic treatments available, oftentimes what people in the regions where this is common do will just take something like a twig or a strong piece of grass or something, and they will wrap the worm around that, uh, that item, that piece of grass or that twig or something, and very, very slowly just kind of turn it periodically to get the worm out of their body. If you Google guinea worm, again, Google images, do guinea worm, you will see some of these situations where people have taken like a stick and are using it to get the worm out of their body. The good news is there have been a lot of efforts to eradicate the guinea worm. It's not completely eradicated yet, but there has been a lot of progress worldwide, some pretty significant progress in helping uh, reduce the number of infections from this parasite. We're moving into the flatworms now, and the first type that we'll talk about are the tapeworms. And then on the next slide, the last slide, we'll talk about the flukes. Good news about the tapeworms is they all kind of function the same basic way. Tapeworms have a head that's called a scolex, and they use that head and these little barbs and everything that's up there to dig into your skin and your intestines and the rest of them is pretty much just filled with reproductive structures. So this worm that can get, you know, 10, 15, maybe 20 feet long, they have their head up here, and everything else is primarily a reproductive structure. And all tapeworms are basically the same. There are three main tapeworms that we are concerned with. There are two in the genus we call Tenia, which is different than the fungus we talked about previously. There's some similarities in this name, uh, Tenia, and uh, Tenia in the fungus, but they're not the same. The first one is T. saginata, and the second one is T. soleate. 
T. saginata is the beef tapeworm. T. soleum is the pork tapeworm. And they are primarily transmitted either through the fecal oral route or sometimes by eating undercooked meat. Either way, what tends to happen is if someone gets some eggs or some larvae or a whole worm into their GI tract, that worm will just kind of burrow into usually the large intestine, can be the small intestine as well. It just sticks in there with those little barbs that it has up there, absorbs all the nutrients from the host, or at least many of the nutrients from the host, and reproduces. And that's what it does. That's its whole life right there. Occasionally, these tapeworms can migrate outside the intestine. There are people who have gotten them in their brain, sometimes in their liver, and other types of organs as well. That's a very rare situation. Most of the time, the tapeworms stay isolated to the intestinal area. And then our third type of tapeworm that I haven't mentioned yet is called Diphylobothrium latum, which is the fish tapeworm. This one, again, transmitted through either the fecal oral route or what's a little bit more common with this one is when people are working with raw fish, they will sometimes get it on their hands and if they don't wash their hands well enough, they will ingest the tapeworms that way. And our last type of organism in this lecture are another type of flatworm. These are the flukes. Flukes, like I said, they're kind of elongated, oval-shaped structures. They usually have some kind of sucker on the end like this. I know you can't see it super well, but it's, it's almost like a suction cup that it just uses to adhere to a place in your body. The three main types of flukes are blood flukes, liver flukes, and lung flukes. Blood flukes are called the schistosomas. Um, schistosomia is the genus. Liver flukes are called fasciola hepatica. Hepatica is liver. And then lung flukes are Paragonimus westermani. That's the, the primary one. Flukes are, overall I would say, in most parts of the world, not as common as the other types of worm infections. One of the reasons for that is oftentimes for a fluke to actually be infectious to a human, it has to go through another host first, and often that host is some kind of snail. So what ends up happening is a lot of times either the eggs or the larvae will get released into a water source, and before that fluke can become infectious to humans, those eggs or that larvae has to do some maturing in a snail first. Once it's done some maturing, it can then exit the snail, and be infectious to humans. So the good news about these is there are lots of ways to kind of break up their life cycle or try to avoid the infectious stages of them. Obviously, it's not always completely possible to do that. There are plenty of people around the world, especially in tropical regions or regions where they spend a lot of time in the water for agricultural purposes, depending on what types of crops are growing or what types of water-based food they might be using, whether we're talking about fish or even sometimes snails themselves or other types of uh, water organisms, maybe birds that are associated um, with these types of habitats. But because of the complex life cycle of many of these flukes, it's sometimes a little bit easier for us to prevent infections with them because if we can stop any one stage of that life cycle, we can stop that cycle of infection, fortunately. <laughs>